episode 75. I'm finished. I want out. This is the One Extraordinary Marriage Podcast, home of the Seven Days of Sex Challenge, featuring your hosts, the authors of the groundbreaking new book, Stripped Down, Tony and Elisa DiLorenzo. Welcome back to One Extraordinary Marriage, where we talk about life, love, and the pursuit of intimacy. You're here with Elisa DiLorenzo. And Tony DiLorenzo. And first things first, we're recording this on Memorial Day 2011. And we so are. we would like to thank all of our military and their families um, for the work that they do and the sacrifices that they've made. Yep. We know um, as many of you. We know many of you. And um, we thank you. It's just as simple yes. as that. It um, is. One of Elisa's very good friends is a military wife. She is. And. We're getting, we're, we're in pre, pre-deployment right now. So um, just a special thank you for all that you do. Yep. So this week we're going to bring something to you that's a bit different. Um, and the reason we're just bringing this up now is because we want it to be known to everybody who listens. And many of you know this, but somebody may be jumping on for the first time. We're not counselors. We're not therapists. Elisa and I are two people who have been married close to 15 years. We've gone through good times. We've gone through bad times. We have found something that works for us and has worked for others. Be it the seven days of sex challenge, the intimacy lifestyle, and other little tidbits we've given you guys over the last year and a half. What we're going to talk about tonight, though, really is a part of marriage and it's the shitty part of marriage. It's the part where you get to the point that you no longer want to be in your marriage. And it's a little scary for us to bring this up because Elise and I had one incident of this and that was about 10 years ago now where we had basically come to the point where we didn't want to be married anymore. It was, it was pretty much we had no feelings of love, no emotional tie to each other. The sex sucked. We weren't dating each other. We barely talked to each other. So in that context, and we want to bring that up, the reason we're bringing this up is a couple of weeks back, I mentioned a very good friend of mine who is going through a, an affair with his spouse. Things have not gone any better. Uh, I've been praying, we've been praying. If anything, they've gone much, much worse. And so I had the opportunity to talk to him. Uh, I didn't talk much, I, I listened a lot. I gave him my advice and a little bit of what I thought should happen just from the interactions I've had with many folks over this last year and a half and prior when they were in this situation. So it just hit me though. Again, very close to home, very good friend of mine. And that night I remember sitting in bed with Elisa and just going, you know what? Maybe it's time we talk about separation and divorce. Maybe it's time that we just get it out there because we hear a lot about it. We, we hear about it at almost every marriage retreat we go to. Mm Mm-hmm. Some couple that is thinking about it, has thought about it, is working through it, has made it through it. And Elisa's reaction was. I I was, you know, I mean, I'm even stumbling over my words right now, which you guys know doesn't happen very often. um, Because this is a scary topic. It's a scary topic for us to broach on the air with you. It's a scary topic to talk about um, for a number of reasons. One is that this podcast has been focused on building up marriages. Yes. And so for us to talk, you know, it's kind of that white elephant in the room Mm -hmm. or elephant in the room, white elephant. That's the gift giving thing. Um, You know, the fact that, you know, in the last, since Tony brought this up that night in bed, we've received six emails. Yeah. But 
that evening though, Elisa was adamant. She was pretty I, much like, I, I don't want to talk. I, about I didn't want to do it I, right. because, because of the fact that, you know, we've, we've taken this podcast in the past in such a different direction. And I, I worry. And there was some fear about bringing this topic up on the air with you guys. Right. And, and so I was like, no, you know, it's kind of like the seven days, you know, the first 60 days of sex challenge where I was like, no, it, sorry. And then over the last five days, We've had six emails. Mm -hmm. We've had my encounter with my buddy. We had another encounter with some very dear friends of ours yesterday who are contemplating uh, separating, possible divorce. And you know what? I think there are times when God's going, guys, this is what I want you to do. And so we couldn't just brush this aside. This, this wasn't an opportunity for us to brush it aside. It, it's something that we feel that um, God has definitely put upon us to talk about. Fortunately for us, we've, we've gotten some great emails um, that we're going to go off of, and we're going to just talk to you. So for those of you who are probably going, hey, I'm not, I'm not there I, I, I'm in love with my spouse. We have great intimacy, all forms of it. I don't need to hear this. I'd say still listen in on this because we are really going to dissect this a lot. And we're going to talk to you guys about how do we constantly keep the intimacy going? And we're not naive and stupid to think that sometimes it's hard to get over this mm -hmm. because of the situation. Again, we've had two face-to-face. -face. Well, I had a phone call. Elisa had a face-to-face. -face. We know the hurts. We know what's happening. Well, it's not only that. Those of you that are, are in a really good place in your marriage, you're going to hear um, through the email that we read tonight um, from a listener who is not in a good place and his advice to those of you that are working on your marriages. Mm -hmm. So, you know, before you click stop on your iPod or, you know, we don't ever want you to do that, but spend, spend the next half hour with us, 45 minutes, because, yep. um, those of you that are in a good place, we've heard from a number of you this week as well, that a lot of what happens on this podcast, you may not agree with everything that we say and we're cool with that, but it brings up discussion in your marriage mm -hmm. and that's what gets us excited that you, what you don't have to agree with us and, and sometimes you guys know on the air, we don't agree with each other. That's human nature. Yeah. But if we can get you talking about what's going on in your marriage, if we can get you talking and saying, okay, you know, we don't want to go down this path. How do we put those systems in place? How do we create the marriage that we want? So we don't find ourselves in five, 10 years going, who the heck are you? Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want to be, in, you know, I don't want to be in this marriage anymore. So, um, let's do take it. Take it away. Yeah. So this comes from Peter and, just a little heads up. Peter's been a long time listener. He, I think he caught on on uh, podcast number four. Mm -hmm. So we're on 74, 75. 75. So there we go. So we're going to, we're going to jump into this. So here we go from Peter. I listened to your last podcast today and felt compelled to write. I was a couple of years into my own journey of discovery and learning about my marriage. When I found your podcast at show number four, I went back and listened to the first three shows and I've listened to each one since. I definitely appreciate the advice, counsel, encouragement, and transparency you guys have shown. I prayed for you and thanked God for you on numerous occasions, but I have a different story and I wanted to use it. I want to use that to tell a different side of don't stop and how that relates to the first email from last week's show. I want to talk about what happens when you don't put your marriage first. You see, after several kids and almost 20 years of marriage, Mine is approaching its end. A month ago, my wife finally told me what I've known for some time was coming, that she wants out. As with any divorce, we share blame equally. Both of us, at various times, didn't prioritize our relationship. I'm guilty of putting too much time into work or hobbies and ignoring my wife's needs. My wife is guilty of putting our kids first over everything, of putting no effort into physical intimacy and ignoring my needs. She's guilty of nagging. I'm guilty of withdrawing. We don't give each other grace and forgiveness when we needed to. 
we were selfish and we didn't serve each other when and as much as we needed to. As a result, before ver- as a result before very much longer, we're going to have to tell our kids that their mom and dad aren't going to be married or living under one roof anymore and then explain to them why without really explaining why. Then we'll have to tell our friends and family that we're splitting up and then try to answer their inevitable questions. Ones I really don't want to answer. How do I give them some level of understanding of why we're divorcing? Why she's decided to call it quits when I don't even really understand myself? How do I explain the unexplainable? How an outwardly happy, picture-perfect family is imploding before their eyes? How do I explain this to their to these people who will try to understand because they care, because they want to help, and because they don't understand? And then we'll have to actually endure the act of splitting our formerly shared life, kids' time, responsibilities, money, possessions, and we'll deal with the fallout from that, possibly, for years. <sighs> I, I, Where do you want to start? Start with the beginning. Okay. You know, I think, you know, Peter brings up probably the number one point that by not prioritizing your marriage, by not putting the spousal relationship first, the other stuff takes over and will eventually destroy it. Right. And, and this is something Elisa and I talk about a lot about in our book, Stripped Down. The first chapter is called From the Top Down because we believed in our marriage when it was out of control. We started looking at it and we started going, what's happening here? What are we doing? If we believe that we follow an almighty God, but we are looking at everything else first and then we're basically last on that list, there's something wrong. And so we realized some time back that, you know what? You got to prioritize and you got to have God first, your spouse second, kids, work, other activities. And we've seen it time and time again when that order is all jumbled up. We can pretty much, when we've done our small group studies, Mm -hmm. we could pretty much tell you what's going on. Well, and and again, the last time that we did a small group on stripped down, um, there was a couple in there where the wife had, this was her second marriage and her first marriage. She's very open about it, but it ended because she put the kids first. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, you know, her husband didn't even rank and you know, I'm not pinpointing women putting their children first. It could very easily be the husband. Oh yeah. The the father doing it as as well. Um, I appreciate what Peter says here too, is that, you know, there's no, no one, neither one of them is a hundred percent responsible for this situation. And I think that's a really big point as well is that in any situation, whether it's, you know, unmet expectations, whether it's hurt feelings, whether it's, you know, miscommunications, there is responsibility on both sides of the equation. Mm-hmm. It might be 90, 10, it might be 50, 50, it might be, you know, 35, 65. But if I'm not communicating to Tony and then he doesn't do something and I get mad, it's not entirely his fault for not doing something. If I didn't tell him mm-hmm. that I wanted it done, I have some responsibility for that. If I'm neglectful towards Tony and he gets frustrated with that. I bear the responsibility of not meeting my husband's needs. You know, it's not just his fault that he goes out and does something irresponsible. I wasn't taking care of business at home. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I think the fact that he brings up that there were issues on both sides of the equation here, you know, nagging and withdrawing and putting hobbies and friends, you know, ahead of the marriage and, you know, kids ahead of the marriage. There were, there were so many things. A- and we hear this, you know, not just in this email, but in other emails that we receive from you. There are so many things that take priority over your marriage. A- and when you allow all of those other things to move into that number one spot, 
it's hard to even wonder how your marriage is going to make it through if you don't make some kind of, you know, massive shift in your thinking. Yeah, and one thing, I think what ends up happening too is, is like Peter was saying here, there's, there's a lot of blame that goes on. They're both responsible. There are times in our marriages, and we've brought this book up before, The Question Behind the Question by John Miller. Personal accountability. I mean, sometimes your spouse isn't doing what you want, but I think the question to ask there, instead of going, why isn't he or she not doing this for me? Maybe you need to turn that question around and go, what can I do to engage my spouse? What can I talk about so that we can enhance our emotional intimacy? What is it that I could do that would you know, dramatically change the atmosphere, the, the tone of our marriage? Mm-hmm. Many, many a times we want to be the victims. We want to sit there and go, oh, woe is me. Why don't they do something? And maybe we need to start looking at ourselves and looking to God and going, God, what can I do right now to make a difference in my marriage? And don't go to your guy friends. Don't go to your girlfriends. Look upward and determine what that could be. Because I will tell you, when we can start taking personal responsibility and personal accountability for our marriage, you'll be surprised what can start to transpire because you're not always being the victim and you're not always blaming. And this comes on both ends. Mm-hmm. It's The blame game is such a dangerous um, disease in a marriage because once it starts, somebody's got to step up and be the bigger person to stop it or it just escalates. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when you take that accountability, um, it just, it pulls that off and says, you know what, I'm, I, I, I'm going to stand up and be the bigger person and I'm not doing it to pat myself on the back. I'm not doing it to say I'm the bigger person. I'm just doing it because we need to stop this, this junk going on in our marriage. No. You know, if, if we're going to move forward to a positive place, somebody has got to stand up and say, you know what, I, I'm taking, resp- I'm owning my part in this. Now, I can't promise you your spouse is going to own their part. But taking responsibility for your part begins that process. Right. Yeah. And you begin to grow. You begin to grow. And, and, you know, quite honestly, sometimes your spouses are not going to want to grow up. I mean, we're we're seeing that in some of the relationships that we know about right now. Um, You know, one spouse is taking ownership. They're, you know, trying to grow. They're trying to move forward. And their spouse is not doing so. Right. And, and that's a challenge. And it's a challenge, you know, is um, going back to this email when he says, you know, how do I explain the unexplainable, how an outwardly happy picture perfect family is imploding right before their eyes. Um, this kind of ties into what we've talked about on, I don't even know how many episodes about taking off the mask and being real. Mm-hmm. And, you know, being real with, with family and with friends and not having it, you know, we don't want people to see our faults. We like people thinking we've got all our shit together. And the reality is, is that there are lots of times we don't, we're just hanging on by a thread, but people don't know that because we're too proud. We're too worried about what, that they're going to think less of us if we expose our vulnerabilities and we get to the point where we stop doing that even with our spouses. Mm hmm. We hide all the junk from them. We hide all of our feelings. We, you know, we just put on a smiley face. Oh, everything's good. When it's not, whether we're seething inside or we're hurting inside or life is upside down and we just don't know how to tell them. You got to start. Because otherwise you end up in this, in this scenario where everybody's like, oh, they're so happy. What happened? Yeah. How, how, how did this happen? You know, everything's been perfect. Look at them. They, you know, they go to sporting events together and they, you know, attend church together and, you know, she's always doing this and he's always doing that and it looks so great. And then, boom, one day, it's over. There should be a bell going off in your head if this is going on. Ding, 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 ding. You, you need to realize what's going on. 
And again, you could be running down this awesome path together, just going, man, life is great. And then the crap just starts happening. Little by little, something starts adding up and the communication starts stops. And you know what? The kids' activities become more important than either spouse or all of a sudden a new job hits and that job is taking up way too much time. You know, these things can happen. You could be running on this awesome path and then all of a sudden fall off a cliff. And when it does happen, one thing we want to tell you guys is you got to seek counsel. And here's the thing. I know many of you out there live in small towns. Mm -hmm. You live in small communities. You do not trust bringing up what is happening in your marriage with your pastors, with somebody in there. There are people we can, we can lead you to. Mm -hmm. And these are people that use technology. They can use Skype. They can do conference calls. They can do video conferencing with you. Utilize it. There's some crazy statistics that says that most couples wait six years to seek counseling. By that time, it's done. It's over. The marriage is going to end in divorce. They've waited too long. Don't become that statistic. Seek. Come call us. Email us. We have some wonderful people we can refer you to and we do refer you to. And it is my hope that we'll eventually have a directory here on One Extraordinary Marriage where you can find people. Mm -hmm. Because that's what it's about. (laughs) Stop doing it alone. Stop reading every book and not putting anything into practice. Pick somebody that you can trust. Elisa and I have been there. We know we picked and gone to counseling because we needed the help. We needed help the guidance. So don't wait till the very bitter end. You know, you see it, you sense it, do it. More people will spend money on their car when the check engine light goes on faster than they will go find a counselor who will charge them maybe 100 to 125, maybe 150 bucks an hour. Think about that. It's a car. Yes, it's important. It gets you from point A to point B. Is your marriage important to you? That's all I'm going to say. So let's move on. There's more to go. That's a really good analogy. And this is again from Peter. Okay, go ahead. I beg you don't go down our path. There's no pride you can hold on to that's worth the load of crap we're going through. There's no hurt. No issue that's worth holding on to for 5, 10, 15 years or more. It's a cancer on you and your relationship. Let the bitterness and hurt go. Forgive, forget, prioritize your spouse, spend time and energy on them. There's no TV show or computer game that's worth more than your spouse. To the women who rode after having her first child, you're on exactly the same road we were on when we had our first child 15 years ago. I wish somebody had strained us out back then, back when it wasn't too late, before the hurts and disappointments got to too much. Don't wait for your spouse to make the first move. You start. Yes, I know he's failing you too. Who cares? Your pride, hurt, and selfishness are blinding you to what really matters. It's not about being right or who goes first or who wins. It's about building up your spouse and your marriage for the long haul. Your children Your child that you love so dearly will be directly beneficiary, will be the direct beneficiary of of you loving your spouse first. You're at a fork in the road with two possible outcomes, Tony and Elisa or me and my soon-to-be ex-wife. You get to choose. Trust me, you don't want my side. Don't screw this up like we did. Rearrange your priorities and push on and, and don't ever quit. Wow. Um, that part in there about not being right. I mean, that's, that's something that you guys have heard us work through um, on this podcast recently in the last few months mm-hmm. where... And Gina actually even called us out on that after that podcast. A lot of people called out. Yes. Actually, we did have a lot of people. Yes. 
we, we probably had a good almost 10 emails and voice messages on that one. And, you know, that was a situation where it actually just reared its head the other day. You know, we were having... I had been out the night before and Alex and Tony were getting into it about something. And, and I finally just said, look, this is what I'm hearing. And he's like, you know what? You weren't there. And I'm like, all right, I'm taking the kids to school. And I just, you know, politely backed myself out of the house. And this was over the oatmeal. Oh yes. And Tony had this blank look on his face, you know, his memory. Um, but for him that morning, it was about being right, not only with Alex, but with me. I mean, he was he had drawn that line in the sand and he was just like, mm-hmm. nope, I'm going to be right. And it does not matter what the two of you are saying, period. And so, you know, I leave and I don't, you know, talking to the kids. I'm like, I don't like to leave in the morning like this, you know. And so I shoot him a text that morning just saying, you know what, I'm sorry. We need to talk about this. And he's like, I, you know, I'm sorry, too. I left you a note. And I get home and the apology is for needing to be right mm-hmm. instead of listening to what Alex and I were saying. And this needing to be right thing in your marriage, it's destructive. When you start holding on to stuff and, and you know, my memory is stronger than Tony's. So in our case, it's definitely the wife's memory. So I'm not picking on wives or husbands. I'm just saying in our case, I have a really, really strong memory and I could, you know, if I wanted to, I could probably catalog all the hurts over the last 15 years. I choose not to. I don't punish him every time something comes up and says, well, you did that, you know, that one time, you know, or you did this to me or you did this. To, it's over. Right. When we've talked through it, worked through it, it's over. He doesn't get to be punished for it every single time he makes a mistake. Husbands and wives, I don't know which one of you in your relationship holds on to the, to the past. But in a lot of relationships where there's trouble, somebody is holding on to the past and not letting it go and beating the other one over the head with it every time something goes wrong. Or beating yourself up with something. I, I mean, I got, I got an email this week again, another one from a couple who's struggling. Uh, and he, the husband, has been... Um, free of porn for four years. Congratulations to you and all of you who have overcome that. You know I have, and it is a true blessing. But he beats himself up continuously with the guilt of his past. And I led him to Ephesians six ten through 18, mm-hmm. the armor of God, because it's what I've read for many times to help me to just keep the devil away. And so for those of you who are constantly just beating yourself up, don't forget Christ died on that cross for you and I, he's taken those sins from us. And that guilt and that shame that you feel even four years later is all the work of the devil. So dive yourself, get that armor of God on you, Mm -hmm. protect you, protect what infiltrates you. So sorry. Oh, no, it's just, I mean, you know, his last sentence there, you know, rearrange your priorities and push on. Don't screw this up. And, you know, so many of you, uh, just the ones we've heard from this week, are are at that crossroads. You have some decisions to make on what's going to happen going forward. And, you know, he concludes this first. We had a couple of emails with, with Peter this week, but he concludes this first one saying, you know, thank you for not stopping, for pushing on to a relationship you didn't think was possible. And quite honestly, there were times where where we are today, our reality today was not even fathomable. No. <laughs> and, and, and here's a here's an instance. And I mean, I'm going to line this up just a bit because today, uh, Elise and I at night, we've just been a little beat down and tired and trying to make our intimacy lifestyle work. We also are working out, working on our recreational intimacy in the morning. And we've just been coming to bed just pretty pooped out and tired. So this afternoon, uh, praise God, I mean, both kids are out playing with friends or out of the house. We're like, you know what? It's during the day. We're awake. Let's hit it. Let's just get a quickie in. Let's let's be intimate, sexually intimate with each other when we're awake and we're we're fresh and we we want to be. And so 
we took advantage of that. Would that have happened um, four years ago, five years ago? No, it just wouldn't have. This has been a process of time and realize it does take time. It's not a microwave. It's not going to happen overnight. But if you both are growing together and you both are working together, both are finding ways to re-engage each other, um, go on date nights, talk. And that's, that's been the thing just with some of the conversations I've had over the last few days. And, and, you know, I'm hearing from couples where, you know, children have been the focus for so long where lives due to work and kids have, have, you know, gone in a different path. And, you know, I so strongly encourage all of you that are in this place where things aren't going the way you want them to, to take the baby steps. You know, you might actually have to start like the whole courting thing process all over again. You're like, honey, let's go out tonight. What would you like to do? And don't play the I don't know game. It's not allowed. Hmm. You know, maybe you want to go play putt putt or maybe you want to go for a walk along the beach and it might feel incredibly awkward because you guys have been drifting apart for so long but you've got to rediscover your relationship you've got to rediscover at some point in time in the past this person meant so much to you that you decided to marry them so at some point in time that there was there were fireworks I have to think somewhere along the way there were fireworks if you actually you know, made it to the point where you said, I do. Mm-hmm. So you got to go back and figure out where, what was that? What did we have in common? What did we like to do together? Because if we've forgotten how to do that, then you need to rediscover. You need to explore. You need to communicate. You need to say, well, I'd like to take you out to dinner tonight. What kind of food would you like to have? You know, do you want Italian? Okay, then I'll find an Italian restaurant. You know, do you want to go for a walk along the beach? Great. Which beach do you want to go to? Do you want to go to a park? Do you want to hike? Do you want to take a bike ride? It doesn't matter what it is. If you're doing it together and trying to reconnect. Because we waste so much time hoping and wishing that things would get better, that we actually find ourselves paralyzed. Because it's all about, well, I wish he would do this. I wish she would ask me this. I, I wish, I wish, I hope, I dream, I, I would love to get up on your own two feet and start to make that change happen. And, and I know I got called out for, for having tough love last week and I'm, I'm going to own that. I was a little harsh, but I want to say right now, I am going to be tough on this one. You have got to start making the change. You have got to take responsibility for your marriage wherever it is You've got to stand up and say, you know what? This is not the marriage I want. I am going to work on making it better. Because if you start making changes on yourself, if you start saying, you know what? I'm going to own my stuff. I'm going to, you know, if it's whatever those little things are, if I'm not making the marriage a priority, if I'm putting the kids first, then I'm going to start putting my spouse first. If work's taking priority, then I'm going to move work down and put my spouse first. You know? If I look, and, and I'm guilty of this, you know, you guys, if any of you saw the video during the seven days of sex challenge, there was a period of time where Tony would come home from work and I was in a less than desirable t-shirt and pair of jeans virtually every day. I mean, he did not have much to look at. That was me saying, guess what? You know what? It doesn't really matter to me what you, you know, what, how I'm dressed for you. But when we were dating, I know some of you have seen that picture of our very first date that he posted it, it, up. It's up on our Facebook fan page. Okay. The girl spent two hours getting me ready for our first date. My roommates. Two hours. And I can't put on a clean t-shirt for this guy? That was me. I had to make a change. And you know what? When I did, guess what he started doing? He started getting dressed up too. We saw some friends this weekend that have never seen Tony in a pair of pants. And he was in nice jeans and a you know, good looking shirt. And they're just looking at him like, what happened to you? And that's because you made that change in me many years ago. No. I made the change in myself and you responded. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. I did not try and change you. I did not tell you you had to change. I took ownership for what I was doing and you responded by yeah. wanting to match what I was doing. Yeah. So true. So, so true. That, that, that one is definitely, Elisa just took the lead on that and I was just sitting there going, holy crap, my wife is looking good. I cannot be going out with this gal in shorts and a t-shirt when she's just like all spiffied up and I'm like, dude, other guys are going to start looking at her and she's going to start looking at them and you know, this was honestly going through my mind going, wow, if she, if she keeps going like that and I don't step up to the plate, there's going to be somebody else who's going to step in here. And that's when I made my change. I was like, okay, I better start finding some nicer jeans, or something that was at least in style and not from like the early not 10 years old. Yeah. And, and many of you might be going, well, gosh, this all sounds good, but where do I start? Pick up our book strip down. Honestly, that, that is your guide to transforming your marriage. It's what we have done. It's 13 steps. You can read it in a week. You can go through it. I don't, I don't suggest you do that. I suggest you sit down with your spouse. You read it to each other. There's a he said, she said section. I mean, husbands read my section. Wives read Elisa's section. Go through those questions. Answer them truthfully, honestly. This isn't labor-intensive book here, folks. We made it simple so that we could understand it. We, we wrote it like we talk, and we've heard from another number of couples that have actually worked through this book. And, and it's not a book that's written where you have to go from chapter 1 to chapter 13, you know, because some couples will be like, you know what, I'm good on that section. Yeah. Skip it. But if there's an area that's not good for you guys... Start the conversation by reading what we, what we lived and talk about how that is reflected in your own marriage mm. because you, you're not in this marriage thing by yourself. Right. Your, your relationship is your relationship and that is one thing. Um, actually, when Peter wrote us back another message, he, he made this really powerful point and he said, um, you know, talking about how divorce is at work and, and so many, and you know, it just seems like all of a sudden we're in this season where we're hearing divorce and it's, it's milling about with a, a lot of you and just our personal relationships. And he said, he goes on to say, that's one reason why what we do is so important. See, I believe you chose the path you want to be on. And part of that is who you allow close as advisors. I chose to listen to podcasts on marriage and family literally every day for the past two plus years. I chose to read books on the same topic. By the same token, I chose not to find others who were in an unhappy, failed, or failing marriage and then bitch about what my wife was or wasn't doing. I can't say that my wife made that same choice. There are so many people failing at marriage and it's so very easy to relate to them and it just encourages you down the wrong path. It makes it okay. Don't put yourself in that position, folks, where you are surrounding yourself, and we've said this before, with people who are going to belittle your spouse, who are going to tell you that it's okay to get a divorce. You know, they can totally relate to what you're going through because they've been through it and they got divorced. And you know what? Look at how it's worked out for them. Find people that are going to support marriage. Find advisors that believe in the institution of marriage. You know, that's not to say that you, you might not still need the counsel down the road. I mean, if it doesn't work out, it, that is a very real possibility. But as you're going through this season where you're trying to fix your marriage, find people that are supportive of marriage. Mm -hmm. Ladies, your girlfriends that are complaining about their husbands all day long, as soon as you start to complain about yours, guess what? It's a feeding frenzy. Oh, yeah, well, mine does it. <laughs> You guys know about it. I mean, we women, and I'm speaking in generalities about me and my friends. Sometimes when we get on topic where something negative, it's a total feeding frenzy. Mm -hmm. You have got to find supportive, encouraging people that support marriage, not those that are supporting the dissolution of marriage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's critical. Yeah. And for those of you who've, you're listening to this and, and we're hitting home. I mean, you've been through this. You've been through the depths of hell. You know, 
you've gone through an affair. You've come out of it. Please, when we post this up, it's going to be on oneextraordinarymarriage.com. It's episode 75. Instead of emailing us personally, please, please write and comment there because we would love to have a resource where we can direct other couples so that they can see when they're going through a tough time that others have been there and this is how they have gone out of it. Mm -hmm. This is how they have worked through it. I know you guys are an amazing community and mine and Elisa's voice is just one, but I know there are many of you out there who have gone through hell and back and your story is important. Your story is important to many people. So if you have to use an anonymous name, please do, but your story matters. And we want to be able to, to send people here because Elisa and I can only say so much about this. You know, we're hoping that we're at least lighting the flame so we can get this out there, so we can hear the wonderful stories of God just bringing you guys back together and how you did it. How you work through the infidelity, how you work through the pornography, how you work through the the lack of communication, how you work through somebody who is a workaholic, how somebody how you guys work through an empty nest when one of you was so dependent on the child or the children and now you had to reconnect. They're all amazing stories. And they all can touch lives. So we just ask you, please comment there. If you have something very personal, obviously you can always email Elisa and I, uh, ask Tony at one extraordinary marriage.com or ask Elisa at one extraordinary marriage.com. And if you'd love to call in eight, five, eight, eight, seven, six, five, six, six, three. We want to hear from you guys. We're, we're not saying that we're, we're spot on with this. We know that we know we got some, some things that many of you may or some of you may just not agree with. That's cool. That's totally cool. But I want your stories in the comments. Please put them there. Okay. To that, what do we got? Anything good? For the week? Yeah. Let's, let's leave it with the good stuff. You know what? I'm going to give you guys some good stuff. We got uh, a couple of new people that have written a review on the One Extraordinary Marriage podcast, which we love. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You can leave yours there as well. Rate us, review us. Uh, This one comes from LMD Schmuck, May 24th. What I've been looking for. I can relate to Tony's side of things so well. Thank you very much. It's nice to hear both spouses' sides of things. I'm so glad they continued podcasting because I have been trying to catch up so I can call in on some of the current topics. Only about 20 more to go. Keep going. Mm -hmm. And thank you, Tony and Elisa. You have definitely helped my marriage immensely. And then we have another one from Jay Kato. Uh, Real, five stars. This was on May 12th, uh, 2011. Recently discovered the podcast. Nothing fancy. Just a great peek into the marriage of ordinary people. That we are. Thank you, man. They discuss the events in their lives in such an open and honest way that most people only wish they could communicate like that. You guys can. You guys can. I know you can. The thing is, and they point this out, most of us could if we make made a conscious effort to do so. Intimacy on level on all levels is a repeated theme. And it is. Intimacy is important. It's not just sex. It's not just the physical. It's not just the kisses and the hugs and the slap on the ass. Intimacy is about being emotional. It's being about intellectually. (laughs) What? I'm only laughing because in the last two days, I think Alex has given me a little pat on the bottom about four times. (laughs) I'll just come up. Hey, mom. (laughs) 
<laughs> and, uh, and, and I wonder where he gets it from. Yep, go ahead. Yep. Go ahead. You're a little but slap on the it's not, it's not just about that. You know, it's emotional. It's intellectual. It's financial. It's spiritual. It's recreational. It's diving into those five so that you have the physical and the sexual that you also desire. So, mm-hmm. you guys, we thank you. We love you. Have a fantastic week. Thanks for listening to the One Extraordinary Marriage Podcast. We would love to hear from you. You can go ahead and give us a call at area code 858-876-5663 or send us an email to info at oneextraordinarymarriage.com. The website is oneextraordinarymarriage.com. And while you're there, you can sign up for our Marriage Minute Monday newsletter and you can also purchase Tony and Elisa's new book, Stripped Down. It's available now in print, audio, and ebook formats. Also, the One Extraordinary Marriage Podcast has sponsorship opportunities available now. If your business is interested in sponsoring this podcast, please contact us at oneextraordinarymarriage.com.